The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen only mode. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our webinar today. Our webinar is on mapping manholes with a handheld LIDAR. My name is Steve Combe. I'm with Frontier Precision, and I'll be your presenter today. Uh, excuse me, I'll be the moderator today. We have a special guest presenter from uh, GeoSlam, uh, Brian Rosenstill, who will introduce in just a minute. But before we get started, just a couple housekeeping items. Uh, just a reminder that everyone will be muted throughout the duration of the webinar. We found that this is the best way to minimize background noise and disturbances uh, so everybody can hear uh, the audio content of the webinar. We're also going to wait till the end of the webinar to address questions. So if you have any questions, um, Hopefully we address everything during the course of the webinar, but if you do have any, um, you'll see on the uh, control panel over to the right, there's a questions pane. So you can go ahead and click on that at any time during the webinar and uh, submit your questions. And then at the end of the webinar, um, we'll go ahead and uh, read those questions aloud so everybody can hear those and uh, hopefully address those questions to your satisfaction. So before we actually get into the meat of our webinar, just a couple uh, introductory items. This webinar is number six in a series of uh, seven webinars on municipal water resource um, items that we're promoting this year. In December, we started with a webinar on tools for managing growing communities and aging infrastructures. So this talked about um, hardware and software to monitor um, water and wastewater distribution and conveyance systems um, and get real-time uh, manageable workflows. Um, January 13th, we had a webinar on underwater ROVs that can be used for um, videoing and photograph, uh, taking photographs of lakes, um, reservoirs, and water storage tanks. On the 20th, Trimble Water Telog Remote Monitoring, we introduced um, recording telemetry units that are self-contained that set out in your water and wastewater distribution system and measure pressure, flows, levels, rainfall, and then send real-time data back to your, to your computer for action. And then on February 3rd, we introduced uh, pipe inspections using pipe crawlers. On the 10th, uh, Trimble Unity Work Management and High Accuracy Mapping. So we talked about software for manager, managing workflows in the, your municipality uh, for um, taking a GPS out and doing high accuracy mapping of hydrants, um, manholes, basically anything in your municipality. And today we'll be talking about mapping manho manholes with a handheld LIDAR. And then lastly, on the 20 24th, a webinar with Frontier Precision and CityWorks uh, talking about integrating the CityWorks uh, work order management software into your system. All of these webinars um, have been recorded and will be recorded and placed on our Frontier uh, YouTube channel. And after the uh, webinar is over in a couple of days, you'll receive a link to a recording of that particular webinar. And if you go out to that, you'll be able to also access the previously recorded webinars as well. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and turn the time over to Brian Rosenstiel with GeoSlam and I'll let him introduce himself and lay out the agenda for today's webinar. All right, thank you, Steve. All right, and Steve, are you seeing my screen right now? Yeah. Excellent. All right, well, thank you everybody for taking the time out of your day to uh, to join us for this webinar on mapping manholes with handheld LIDAR. Um, I work for a company called GeoSlam, a manufacturer and seller of um, this, uh, this technology. So um, I'd like to say on behalf of everyone at GeoSlam, you know, thanks for Thanks for joining us today, and uh, thank you to Frontier Precision for putting this on, and Steve for doing all the legwork to to get this up and running. So it's always always great to have a forum to uh, speak to 
uh, professionals about this technology. So I will quickly introduce myself. My name is Brian Rosenstiel. Uh, I'm a senior solutions architect with GeoSlam. Essentially what that means is I focus on the technical side of our sales pipeline. So doing demonstrations, helping companies to integrate this technology, uh, helping to, to push development of this technology in the right direction and, and things kind of along those lines um, and work very closely with our dealer network as well. And, uh, doing training and helping with their customers and the opportunities that they're working on. Hey, Brian, um, for more information, can I interrupt you just a bit? I don't think we're seeing your screen. You might need to click on a something to show my screen in the upper um, right hand corner there. We're uh -huh. actually looking at the login screen. There we go. Are you seeing my yes. uh, presentation? Oh, uh, yeah, we're actually seeing your desk, your desktop screen. Okay. Sorry. Sorry, folks, there's always got to be a little hiccup here and there. Let's pause this. Go back one slide. How about now? Uh, we're still just seeing your desktop. There we go. Now we're on. Sorry about that, everyone. Yeah. Thank, thank you for for, uh, for interrupting me there, Steve. That's uh, that's yeah. very important. Um, so, anyways, just just back to my intro slide, um, and that that's my email as well. If you want to reach out to me directly, and for more information on uh, GeoSlam as a company or any of our products, you can always visit geoslam.com. So on to the agenda for today's webinar. Uh, first thing we're gonna be talking about is just a little bit more about GeoSlam, who we are as a company, what we do, uh, the kind of technology we, we provide. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about SLAM mobile mapping as a whole, um, kind of how SLAM works and, and uh, how our technology works. And so you really get an understanding of what you're able to do with it. Then we'll jump into our Zeb family. Uh, we've got three products that I wanna to present to you today. All of these are suitable for the application of mapping manholes, but some have advantages and disadvantages in different areas. Um, so I'll kind of talk a little bit about those and also run through the specs of each one of those three systems. And then we'll go through uh, basically how to map a man manhole with the GeoSAM system, what that order of operations, those step-by-step -step instructions look like, and I've got a little diagram as well that kind of shows what that process is. Um, typically only two or three minutes uh, process, maybe up to five minutes to, to map a typical manhole, um, but it can vary a little bit depending on application and what you're trying to capture. Uh, then we'll jump over to take a look at some sample data as well as look at some case studies of how some of our customers are using this technology um, to do this application. And lastly, we'll finish up with some takeaways from GeoSlam. I'm gonna turn it over to Steve to do some wrap up slides as well on his end. And then we will finish up with a Q&A session. Um, and just another reminder, if you have any questions as we go through, please enter those questions, type those questions into the chat window uh, and go to webinar. And uh, Steve will be addressing those with myself at the end of the presentation. All right, so a little bit more about GeoSlam as a company. Uh, just some quick background. Uh, GeoSlam was founded in Nottingham in the UK. Um, now we are expanded to a global dealer network and have, have offices, uh, several sales offices throughout the, uh, throughout the world and have really kind of geared towards being more of a global company. Uh, essentially what we do is we try to make it easy to capture and connect data from the world around us, whether that's a building or it's you know out in a forest or you know we're capturing data down in a manhole or in a mine or something like that there's there's all kinds of um, different applications and uh, things that that we're able to do with this technology um, it's not geared just towards one specific industry uh, it really gives people the power to collect geospatial data from difficult environments this is a very modular very versatile technology and works in all sorts of different situations, indoors, outdoors, underground, really anywhere um, that you want to map data, you're able to do it with the GeoSlam system um, with some exceptions, but very few. 
Um, and our tagline for the company is GeoSlam is the smart way to map and understand spaces. I think the two uh, key words in that phrase are map and understand. We want to be able to capture this data and capture it quickly, but we also want to be able to do something with this data and uh, use that to, to understand the space and, and uh, get takeoffs from it and, and use that data in an intelligent way. In just a brief history of GeoSlam, uh, we are actually responsible for the very first launch of the world's first SLAM-based handheld mobile mapping system back in 2011. Originally, we called it the ZEB. Now we call it the ZEB-1. Um, all of our systems now are called ZEB something. So we have the ZEB Revo, ZEB Horizon. Um, so it's all kind of a spin-off of that original technology that was generated back in, um, or put on the market rather, back in 2011. Um, we pioneered the SLAM algorithm and um, really uh, kind of launched this technology into the commercial world um, back in 2011. So, um, yeah, we've been uh, kind of in the SLAM industry for over 20 years. Uh, even before that, we were developing other SLAM-based products. Um, so we've been 20 years of experience in making complex problems simple. So here are some of the benefits of GeoSlam and really SLAM technology as a whole. Um, you get very rapid results. Uh, you can typically scan uh, captures in, in only minutes. So a typical capture would be maybe 15 or 20 minutes. On a manhole, you're able to capture something uh, typically in five minutes or less. Um, this technology is extremely versatile. So of course, it's not just for scanning manholes. We can scan all sorts of different environments um, as I mentioned before, um, and a big benefit is that you do not need any GPS or any kind of external sensors in order to maintain accuracy. Uh, the system itself is able to maintain its accuracy on a local and global scale. And because we are uh, so quick and so versatile, you end up saving quite a bit of money. Um, we found that GeoSlam systems are usually about 10 times faster than traditional survey methods or even other LIDAR uh, surveying methods um, just because of how quick and plug and play uh, these systems are. And we have user friendly software. We try to make our software as, as simple to use as possible. Uh, most of the processing on the back end just takes place in a few minutes and it's just a matter of taking the, the raw data off the, off the system and dumping it into a program and letting it process for a little while. Um, and then you get a, a 3D point cloud. Uh, with one of our systems, it actually does it in real time, so we don't even have to do that back-end processing. And proven technology, as I mentioned, we've been in the industry for almost 20 years now, and um, you know we've kind of developed and pioneered this technology, and it's not experimental. This is not phase one. This is not a beta product. This has been on the market for quite some time, and um, it's really been proven to, to work in all kinds of different applications and industries and use cases. And where to find us, like I said, GeoSlam is uh, headquartered in the UK, um, but we have 10 global offices. We sell through an, over 90 global distributors throughout uh, 59 countries worldwide. So um, you can pretty much find us anywhere you are uh, through a local distributor or a local sales office. All right, so let's talk a little bit about SLAM, what it is and how it works. So SLAM is an acronym. SLAM stands for Simultaneous Localization and Mapping. Essentially what that means is that uh, we're kind of constantly answering two questions. That question is, what those questions are, where am I in space and what does this space look like? And by constantly answering those two questions back and forth, we're able to map a space and uh, position ourselves within that space. So SLAM means different things for different companies uh, and different manufacturers, but for GeoSLAM, it's really quite simple. We take raw data from two different sensors. That's the LIDAR sensor uh, in the form of 3D laser measurements. And we have an IMU, which is an inertial measurement unit. And we gather rough positional data from uh, that IMU. And we combine these two things into um, our SLAM algorithm to do feature recognition. So it's basically, uh, recognizing uh, three-dimensional features. So that could be surfaces, it could be objects in the space, and it's kind of tracking your relationship to those objects. And we're continuously performing 
uh, basically a cloud to cloud registration. Uh, if you're familiar with LIDAR static scanning, uh, cloud to cloud registration is a common way to combine data together. Essentially, we're doing a continuous cloud to cloud registration um, in order to stitch our data together. And uh, the end result is a registered 3D point cloud. Um, and like I said, it's all a fairly automated process. It doesn't really take um, a lot of expertise or time to, to get to that result. It's pretty plug and play. You just grab the file off, dump it into the software, and maybe 10 or 15 minutes later, you have a fully registered usable point cloud that you can export to a universal file format and bring into just about any software under the sun that will accept um, a, a point cloud. So some of the benefits of this technology um, is that there's no need to remain static while scanning. So you don't have to scan it from a fixed position. You can do it while you're on the move. Some of our systems we can even, you know, attach to vehicles and uh, attach to UAVs and things like that. So uh, you can capture a tremendous amount of data in a short amount of time because you're able to scan at the speed that you can move through a space, uh, move through an area. And as I mentioned before, the stitching of the data, the, the SLAM is all automated. Um, it is, does not require any kind of expertise or understanding of uh, even really survey technology to, to use this system. Uh, it's pretty plug and play. And another benefit is that there is no need for GPS, control points, external receivers, any kind of external um, information. Uh, the, the system is pretty much self-sufficient. and. Uh, is able to stitch this data together and maintain its accuracy uh, over a pretty big capture area um, without any of those. However, we do have the ability to uh, bring GPS data or control points to do georeferencing uh, on the back end. So that is an option. Um, they're just not necessary for uh, maintaining accuracy and stitching data together. And this graphic here kind of shows uh, the principles of how the system actually works. So essentially, um, we have that LIDAR sensor that sits in the middle. Uh, I have it kind of positioned vertically just because that's the easiest way to visualize it. But that LIDAR sensor shoots out in a fan or an arc. Um, that arc covers about 270 degrees. So you have about 270 degrees in the horizontal. The only things that you're missing are basically what's obstructed by the face of the scanner itself, um, which are kind of back to your, your peripherals. Um, which encompass about 270 degrees of, of capture in the horizontal. And then that sensor then rotates on its axis as it begins scanning um, and captures 360 degrees vertically. So everything above you, everything below you um, gets captured. Uh, the things that are right in front of you are getting captured kind of on a continuous basis. So the system does have sort of a point and shoot mentality where you can um, point it toward an object and you'll get the highest data density on the object that you're pointing it towards, but you are still capturing data above you, below you, to the sides of you every time the system uh, sweeps past it, which is a little less than once per second. Um, but it is important to kind of understand this geometry and how the data um, is actually captured when you're in the field and, and you're um, using the system. And it's just kind of a nice thing to, to explain to people because it is a very common question of how, how it actually works. So basically the SLAM principle, uh, have this graphic that sort of shows what it looks like, but we have two, two types of SLAM. So we have a local SLAM and global SLAM. Essentially local SLAM is what's happening in real time. Uh, so it's the real time stitching and, and processing of the data. Um, that happens on the back end with some of our systems and it happens on the front end on the data logger with some of our systems as well. And I'll go through that when I talk about the specific uh, systems that we offer um, in, in the next section. Um, but that local SLAM is basically the, the real-time stitching of data. Whereas global SLAM is uh, basically a second iteration of SLAM where it accounts for loop closures and redundancy in the data. So any place that I've scanned more than once or any objects I've scanned more than once, it accounts for that redundancy in data and uses that redundancy to fix any error that may have been accumulated during local SLAM processing. So creating closed loops and creating data redundancy is very important. Um, but essentially what local SLAM looks like is uh, we start the system, the system captures its init initial position, captures initial features around it. Then once we pick that system up and begin moving, the IMU, the inertial measurement unit, is able to roughly calculate our change in position. Um, it's not terribly accurate all by itself, but it gives you kind of a rough basis to go off of. 
And then again, we calculate those same surfaces and the same features around us. We identify which are the same and which have uh, changed from you know, position A to position B. And then uh, we use that to basically mash those together and update our trajectory path to get a high degree of accuracy. So this process, these four steps that I just showed are essentially what consists of local SLAM. That's what it's doing in real time continuously. It's not a second by second, it's an instant by instant basis. Um, so it's continuously doing that throughout the capture. And then global SLAM is essentially uh, when, we, when we do a typical capture, we try to start and stop the system in the same point. So we pick up the system and we go walk through the, the space or the capture whatever area it is we're trying to capture and then we bring it back to that same start point. And that creates that redundancy in data. We also have loop closures and, and redundancy within the actual data set itself. And uh, that helps to, to fix all of the error that, that gets accumulated by local SLAM and uh, essentially get you a very highly accurate result. So that uh, redundancy in data is very important to, to maintain accuracy of the system. And we'll talk a lot about that a little bit more when we talk about how to scan a manhole uh, in a later section. So the result of this, uh, this data is a three-dimensional point cloud. Uh, I'm sure some of you are quite familiar with these already, but if you're not, I'll just kind of give you a little bit of an overview of what a point cloud is and what you can do with it. Um, it's essentially a data set consisting of millions of three-dimensional data points. So every time uh, the LiDAR sensor uh, gets a point, it basically you know, shoots the laser out, it gets a return on that, and it uses either uh, time of flight or a phase shift algorithm in order to determine the 3D position of that point that it just hit. It does that with our system hundreds of thousands of times per second, so the resulting uh, data is uh, millions of points. Each point is written with an XYZ value, uh, so your typical um, Cartesian plane value, and then we also uh, can assign other values to each one of these XYZ points, such as RGB, so we can assign colorization using cameras or other methods. Um, we can collect intensity, which is basically the strength of the return of the laser, which helps you differentiate materials and things like that as well. Uh, normal values, which helps you uh, differentiate directions of surfaces, things like that. Um, there's a variety of other different um, values that we can write into a point cloud as well, but those are some of the, the main highlighted ones. And overall, we get a very high degree of local and global accuracy. I'll talk about the specs of our systems uh, here in just a minute, but generally it's anywhere from millimeter to centimeter level of accuracy globally and or locally. So what we can use these data sets for are a variety of different things, including measurements, takeoffs, estimating, calculating volume, calculating area, um, creating as-built documentation, creating design documentation off of that as-built documentation, or using the point cloud as its own as-built documentation. Uh, of course, visualization, um, being able to easily navigate throughout the space. You can use that for things like VR and AR, that, that sort of thing. Um, spatial analysis, creating inspections, uh, inspection reporting, any kind of things in the engineering, construction, architecture, uh, real estate industry, there's lots of applications there. Um, and then actually generating from this data set uh, two-dimensional CAD drawings or three-dimensional BIM drawings. And there's, there's a variety of other things that we can do with, with this data set. So once you have this accurate representation of your data, there's kind of endless amounts of things that you're able to do with it. And like I said, with GeoSlam systems, we export to universal point cloud format. So any, any software under the sun that can accept a point cloud can accept a GeoSlam point cloud. Um, so it does make it a very um, versatile and universal system to use. All right, in this section, we'll jump into the Zeb family. Um, like I said, the original uh, scanner that we developed was called the Zeb. We now call it the Zeb-1, and now everything is kind of uh, an iteration off of that original uh, Zeb-1 scanner. So the first one I want to present to you, or sorry, here's the overview of the three that I want to present, the Zeb-Go, which is kind of our entry-level system, the uh, Zeb-Revo RT. The RT stands for real-time, so again, this is the one that does real-time processing, and you can also use 
a phone or a tablet to view the data in real time as well. And that can mount to the back or you can just hold it in your hand um, and kind of view the data coming together as well as view the data as a finished product when it's done. And then there's the Zeb Horizon, which is kind of the big brother to these other two systems. Um, it has longest range and highest point density and can be used uh, for some of these kind of uh, bigger, uh, longer range, um, larger scope type projects. Um, so the Zeb Horizon is really kind of the most versatile of, of these. Um, as I mentioned, I think at the beginning, all three of these systems can be used to map manholes, but some have advantages and disadvantages, um, you know, differences in cost, things like that. So we'll talk a little bit about that as we, as we go through each one of these individually. So the first one I want to talk about is the Zeb Go. The Zeb Go is actually our newest uh, hardware product launch. Um, we just released it uh, earlier this year, or sorry, last year rather, um, back in the summer. Um, it has a range of 30 meters uh, with a usable range of capturing features up to about 15 to maybe 20 meters. It uses a class one laser that emits at 905 nanometers. Um, again, that same field of view that I mentioned for all of our systems, that's going to be pretty universal. Uh, has an IP rating, ingress protection rating of 64. So it is um, the highest of all of our systems as far as IP rating. Um, so we do recommend it for customers who are using those uh, kind of rugged applications. I would say manhole scanning is definitely one of those where, uh, you know, you're dealing with water and moisture and possibly some splashing and things like that um, in these active manholes. So um, this would be a really good system to kind of start your search um, looking at. Uh, we do post-processing on the back end, so it does not do real-time processing. Uh, so you capture the raw data and then you stitch it together in our hub software on the back end. Um, the scanner weight is 850 grams, um, which is uh, about eight and a half pounds uh, total. Um, we can colorize a point cloud using cameras. We can create reference imagery using a 360 panorama. Um, those are both accessories that get added on. Uh, it has one single laser sensor that captures 43,000 points per second. Um, and we have a relative accuracy and overall global accuracy of one to three centimeters. Um, and we don't really advertise this on here, but we do have a local accuracy, which is kind of those micro measurements, um, you know, from, from one side of the manhole to the other, um, that should be accurate to within about a quarter of an inch or sub centimeter um, accuracy. Uh, then the raw data size that comes out of the system is about 100 megabytes per minute. So it um, seems like maybe a lot, but it actually ends up being a relatively lightweight and small point cloud. Uh, from the system, even compared to our other GeoSlam systems. So this is the Zeb Revo RT. Um, as I said, this is the real-time system. Uh, we're able to do um, SLAM processing and stitching of the data on board. Um, this is probably our most commonly used system for indoor mapping, for uh, things like manhole inspections as well. It's very commonly used for that. It's very easy to use for entry level users because you're actually able to see the data coming together. It gives you that um, kind of QC in real time uh, of your data. Um, I think that's the, the main selling point of this system. It has a lot of the same specifications as the Zeb Go, but you do get a little bit richer data set with it because it uses a slightly higher end uh, sensor that spend, spins at a higher, um, higher rate. Um, so it gets you a little bit cleaner um, a little bit more dense looking data, even though it's technically capturing the same number of points per second. Um, but just to go through some of the specs of it, uh, same range, uh, 30 meters, 15 meters of usable uh, for SLAM processing, same field of view. IP rating is 51 because we are doing um, onboard processing on the data logger. The data logger itself has a lower IP rating. However, the scanner uh, head itself has the same rating as any of our others at, uh, at 64. Um, so that's important to differentiate between the two because sometimes they are separated in, in certain applications. Um, again, the processing is done in real time on the data logger. So there's no need to do all that post-processing. A lot of times we still take the data and bring it over into our hub software to export out to universal file formats or just to use for QC, um, but that's not necessary um, in order to use the data. You can actually grab it right off the data logger. Um, same weight as the um, as the Zeb Go, 
and same number of points per second, same type of sensor, but just a little bit higher end version of the sensor. Um, relative accuracy, again, same one to three centimeters global, uh, sub centimeter uh, local, and same raw data size because it is using a similar sensor. And then the Zeb Horizon, uh, like I said, this is kind of the big brother of our Zeb family um, because it has the longest range and collects uh, the highest point density. Uh, so we have uh, same field of view, IP rating of 54, so it kind of sits in between um, the Zeb Go and the Revo RT, uh, range of 100 meters, usable range for, for uh, SLAM processing and gathering features is about uh, 60 to 70 meters, if I remember right. Um, processing on this system is not done in real time. It's done in post, so you're capturing raw data in the field and then doing the processing on the back end in our hub software. Um, scanner weight is 3.7 kilograms. Uh, with this, we're able to colorize the data using cameras. We capture intensity value, uh, which is important to note with this system versus the other two that I previously mentioned. Um, so that intensity value helps you to kind of differentiate changes in material and um, colorization and things like that, even though it's on a, it's on a grayscale, it's not true world color. Um, true world color can be captured with the, the ZebCam um, when you colorize the point cloud, but um, we can also add that 360 imagery to it as well. It captures 300,000 points per second, so it's over six times as many points as uh, the other two systems and uh, has 16 internal laser sensors and again produces the same relative accuracy of one to three centimeters. Um, with this other sensor that we use inside of this, it does create a little bit more noise in the point cloud. So noise is essentially variation when we're, uh, when we're capturing a surface. So say you were scanning a wall, you would see a little bit more variation alongside of this wall uh, with a horizon than you would with, um, with a Revo or a Zeb Go. And the reason for that is because it uses a different sensor and it's capturing so many more points. So you just see a little bit more variation. So that is something to note, uh, especially when you're in kind of those tight confined spaces, having all that extra noise in the data could be something that might limit your ability to, um, to get takeoffs and measurements and um, create CAD drawings and things like that from, uh, from the data. So important to note, um, but for most cases, it, it is a non-issue. And I wanted to highlight just really quickly some of the versatility as well of the Horizon system. We really do um, advertise this as our, as our Swiss Army knife system. It's able to do all kinds of different stuff. So we can mount it to a backpack. We can uh, integrate a GPS with it. We can add the, the uh, 360 camera to it. We can mount it on a vehicle. Um, we can put it on a pole, things like that. Some of these accessories we also offer for um, for the Revo and the Zeb Go, such as the Pano uh, is universal, um, and the cradle mount is universal, the pole mount is universal, uh, things like that. And I wanted to highlight these two accessories because these are the ones that we typically are using for scanning manholes. Uh, so we have a cradle mount system uh, the cradle mount system essentially mounts the data logger and scanner both together uh, on the same uh, system. And then you can lower the whole uh, system as a unit down into uh, a shaft or a manhole or any kind of underground void uh, with a rope or a cable. It has those side rails that help protect the, the system and keep it from banging up against the sides. Um, it really gives you uh, a lot of depth, so you can go almost as, as deep as you have, have a rope to scan, um, and uh, gives you limited control of the actual scanner, so the direction and positioning of the scanner, because you're just lowering down on, on a rope or a cable, um, but uh, so that is one thing to note, but it does work with any of our GeoSlam systems, um, and we can, we can mount any of them to this and have, have different mounting apparatuses for uh, some of the other scanner heads as well. Um, and then we have the pull mount system, um, the pull mount uh, mounts the scanner and the data logger separately. So we typically attach them with a long five meter cable so that you would uh, have the scanner, you know, on a backpack or, or sorry, the data logger on a backpack or on your hip. And then the actual scanner would be connected to that long cable. So you have the versatility to, to move it wherever you want. Um, this is really good for shallow shafts and manholes, but it only 
uh, gives you about 10 feet of total length. Um, it is possible to use other types of telescoping poles with this system and kind of custom mount them. So um, you have the option to do that as well. You don't necessarily have to use the, the specific one that we offer, um, but these also work with any of our GeoSlam systems. Uh, so it's pretty versatile as well. And this is showing uh, basically how to map a uh, manhole using a GeoSlam system. I have a diagram here and kind of a step-by-step. -step. I apologize for my kind of rudimentary drawing, but it is a very simple process to, to map a manhole with a GeoSlam system. Like I said, it usually only takes a couple of minutes, maybe five minutes at the very most um, to capture a typical manhole. Um, Typically what we'll do is we'll start the scanner from a known point uh, on a flat surface, flat stable surface uh, nearby. Like I said uh, previously, we always try to start and stop the scanner in the same, same spot. So it is nice to pick um, something that's really easy to come back to. You have about a square meter of range in that start and stop point. So it doesn't have to be exactly the point, but it is um, a good practice to try to use the same exact point um, for your starting and stopping position. Uh, once you start the scanner, initialize it, you pick it up, um, and then typically what I'll do is I'll do a quick loop around the perimeter, uh, kind of on a larger scale. Um, what that's doing is it's capturing context data, so it's not um, you basically have you know the the objects around you and and also gives um, some kind of initial positioning and gets the slam started uh, kind of in an easy environment in an outdoor environment. Um, the other thing that that does is it gives you some extra data if you want to take this data and tie it into an existing data set. And I have an example of that when we get into our case studies. So, um, so having that extra overlapping data from um, above the surface to below the surface is, is really, really helpful um, and also allows us to get better SLAM processing. Then uh, we come over to the manhole and slowly lower the scanner past the threshold of the manhole. It is important to make sure we're doing a nice slow transition so that we're getting nice overlapping data from uh, above ground to below ground as we're making that transition through kind of a tight area. And then once we're down, we can lower at a little bit more of a constant rate, um, but still slowly. Uh, and typically we want to rotate the system around kind of as it's as it's lowering or periodically stopping and kind of doing a slow rotation with it. Um, that is much easier to do with a pole than it is with a cable system, but it's, it's fairly easy to rotate a cable system as well. Um, and then uh, pause at the bottom. You don't want to go you know, all the way to the bottom. Uh, you don't have any need to do that really, but usually, usually within a few feet of the bottom. Um, also typically you have water and, and uh, mud and things like that at the bottom of a, of a manhole. So it's important not to, not to get your scanner stuck in that. Um, so again, at the bottom, do kind of a slow rotation, uh, and then once we've done that, we've captured the data that we need, we can slowly raise the system back out. Again, once we get to the threshold of the manhole, uh, we want to make that transition nice and slowly so we get good overlap between inside and outside, and the scanner is able to accommodate for that transition. And then we kind of do everything in reverse. We do a quick loop around uh, to recapture that context. Um, again, that kind of goes back to that global SLAM processing and fixing any error that might have accumulated during the local SLAM processing. So recapturing that same context around the outside um, will uh, give you um, better results and better SLAM processing and maintain that accuracy throughout the capture. And then once we've done that, we bring the system back to our start-stop start point, our stable surface, turn it off and, or deinitialize it and turn it off, um, and then we're, we're ready to go. Um, to get the data off of there, all we have to do is, is uh, either download it off um, through Wi-Fi signal or plug in a USB stick and uh, pull it off that way. And then we'll bring it into our computer and do the processing and we'll have a usable data set right off of the, uh, right off of the system. And that whole process is you know, maybe 10 or 15 minutes to get um, from scanning to a usable data set, especially if you had field processing capabilities or you have a real-time system that's able to do it right there in the field. So I've got some uh, case studies and some sample data to kind of show you what, uh, what you're able to get from this system and what it looks like. 
So just to start, I've got kind of a collage of uh, different uh, manhole scans that we've done over the, the past few months um, and kind of an idea of what these look like. Uh, most of these are with the, excuse me, most of these are with the Revo system. Um, so pretty much everything except for the, uh, the bottom left images of that, and that's, that's actually more of a vertical shaft than it is a manhole. Um, uh, that is with the horizon system, but everything else is with, with the Revo system. Um, and then we also in the middle have some images uh, of some measurements and takeoffs that we've pulled through our GeoSlam draw software. I don't believe that's something I've mentioned yet, but we have the ability to take this data and create what we call orthographic images or slices uh, of the data. And then in any kind of any, any area that we want vertical or horizontal, and then uh, create measurements, you know, calculate areas based off of that, do inspection with these, with these images. Um, there's, there's a lot of different uh, options here. They also plug and play into a CAD environment. So all of these images get written to a DWG format and, and can be easily used in a, a CAD environment or a 3D environment as well to be used as kind of an underlay um, to, to work off of um, with uh, any, any software. Um, and again, these point clouds are all exported to universal file format. So whether you're working in, you know, a civil 3D or a CAD environment or 3D modeling environment, anything that accepts a point cloud will be able to accept a GeoSlam point cloud um, and, and stitch it in. So you can see kind of the level of accuracy and the level of detail that we're able to get with this system, um, you know, as well as being able to capture other things like culverts in the direction of the culvert. Um, out to uh, probably about 20 feet uh, away from the actual manhole, you'll get pretty good usable data. And this is a video that uh, Frontier Precision captured for us, and it's on YouTube, so hopefully it loads. I'll just be quiet as this plays. So that's a great example of what it looks like in kind of real time, um, how, how the data is, is put together and what you're able to do with it and how you're able to create those, those dimensions and takeoffs from the data really quickly as well um, and create different slices and things through it. I believe that was mostly done in uh, Trimble Business Center or Trimble RealWorks, but uh, there's a variety of different software that we can use to, to kind of man manage and analyze this data once we've captured it. So here is a case study. Um, this is one of uh, Frontier Precision's customers um, that purchased a Revo system um, and was able to map uh, over 4,500 manholes throughout uh, Minnesota. Um, and just a couple of um, a couple of quotes from that: um, An engineering survey firms scan the interiors of uh, 4,500 manholes with the Zeb Revo for 
Minnesota municipality. Uh, the, fir the first benefit of this laser scanner is safety. Um, the second is uh, you collect a very comprehensive and complete data set. So I think that's a really good point. Um, one of the main benefits of this system is the fact that it is uh, non-invasive. You're not sending somebody down into a manhole. Um, you're just sending this equipment down in there to, to kind of do the inspection analysis while you're safely uh, sitting at the surface. Um, those can be hazardous and dangerous and uncomfortable environments to be in. Um, a second pull quote from, uh, from this case study is you capture the data you need for one job and then you have that information that somebody else might need for another without a second visit. So the, another really big benefit of this technology in general is that you're able to document a site, you're able to document a space, and then you have that document um, you know, for the duration of a project. So you can always jump back to it, you can always pull different measurements, you can always use it as, as a record of, of uh, that environment at that point in time. Um, and it's something that uh, kind of lives as a document forever, um, as opposed to having to uh, revisit a site to, to capture more information and more data. It's kind of a one and done type situation. If you wanna read this full case study, we have it listed on uh, the GeoSlam website. And uh, there's a link here um, to view that. I believe we're gonna share these slides with you uh, when we're finished, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Um, if not, you can feel free to reach out to me directly or just go on geoslam.com and search our case studies for uh, manholes. Um, and this full case study will be on there. The next one I wanted to highlight uh, is uh, actually a customer that Steve and I met with a couple months ago um, based out of Utah. Uh, this firm specializes in providing services for transportation and roadway projects. Um, they asked us to come out along with Frontier Precision to demo the Zeb Revo and Zeb Discovery systems. I haven't talked about the Zeb Discovery system yet, but that's uh, basically an integration onto our um, our Zeb Horizon system that allows uh, allows you to mount a high resolution camera onto a backpack along with the system and use that for for uh, colorization and a really high definition integration between the two. Um, so if you want want to learn more about that discovery system, I'm I'm happy to to share some more information with you. Again, geoslam.com uh, has everything that you might need on that. Um, but anyways, we basically scanned this uh, local roadway project that was just down the street from them. Uh, we scanned six different manholes with the uh, Revo RT system, and then we scanned the surrounding roadway uh, with the discovery system. Again, uh, integrates the horizon, so it's essentially horizon data. Uh, the entire scan uh, was less than an hour of total scan time. The longest part was really doing the, the overall walk with the discovery system. That was probably a 15 minute scan. Uh, each manhole was under five minutes to, to capture. Um, and since then, this firm has, has rented the system for a lot of similar projects that they're working on and is in the process of purchasing the system. Um, but below we have some examples of the data that we captured from this, from this demo. Um, and you can see even how uh, culverts off of the manholes are able to connect to one another. And um, we used the merge tool within uh, GeoSlam Hub software to stitch all of this data together. So it's all being stitched together using overlapping geometry. So that's again why we do that kind of perimeter loop when we do our initial um, scan before we, before we set the scanner down inside the manhole uh, to capture that context and overlapping data so that we can marry it to to other data. Um, another thing we could do during that outside loop is um, collect control points as well and use that to, to geo-reference. So that's all I have um, on my end uh, for case studies. Um, if you're interested in uh, demoing this technology or learning more about this technology, we do offer currently a demo in the box program where we will ship you a GeoSlam system and let you try it in your home or um, in, on a project uh, for free. Um, if you're interested in that, the web link uh, to register for the program is below uh, geoslam.com slash demo in a box um, and we will reply to you and, um, and get that set up. And of course, we're also on social media, pretty active on uh, LinkedIn and 
uh, Instagram and have a YouTube account and Vimeo account and all that kind of stuff. So if you're interested in learning more, you can find us on all these different social media platforms. And that is all for me. Uh, I would like to thank you guys for attending and taking the time out of your day uh, to watch this webinar. Um, again, I'm Brian Rosenstein with GeoSlam and there's my email below if you want to reach out to me directly. Um, you're welcome to do so. Uh, you can also find more information on GeoSlam and our products at geoslam.com. So I recommend you go check that out. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Steve to, to have some closing slides and then I believe we're going to open it up to uh, any questions that you've listed in the chat window. Yes, uh, thank, yes. You, uh, thank you. And I'm making you the presenter now here. Yeah, got that. Thank you. So you should be seeing my slide now. I just wanted to emphasize that uh, Future Precision does have products in stock. Products in stock. Brian, I'm wondering if you can uh, mute yourself for a minute. Getting a little bit of a reverberation and echo, great. So we have some items in stock uh, for rental demonstration as well as purchase. Uh, so obviously new items for purchase that are in stock uh, in our inventory. But we also have um, units that we rent and that we use for demonstrations. So if basically somebody wants a, what a car dealer would call a previously owned uh, unit, you can purchase those at substantial discounts as well. And before we go to uh, question and answers, I, I do want to advertise our Frontier Precision Texpo. This is March 30th, 31st, and April 1st. We do have four different tracks of presentations covering everything from survey, mapping and GIS, drones and uh, UAS, unmanned construction, scanning and imaging, mosquito and vector control, water resource presentations, and then invasive plant control. So this is a three days of uh, technology being discussed, uh, applications and answers. So you can go out to our website, uh, frontiertexpo.com and register for that. We do have a uh, early bird registration that runs until March 15th. So for um, $49, you can register for as many um, technical presentations that fit your interest. And then just want to introduce our um, West and Midwest offices. So we have a lot of uh, coverage for um, providing somebody locally that can work with you and help you out with your needs. Now, lastly, we'll uh, go to questions. So if you have any, uh, I'll just be reading these off of the um, questions pane. So let me go to that right now. I'll read the questions aloud. And um, we'll pick on Brian to answer those. Okay, looks like we have at least uh, two or three questions here. So the font is kind of small, so forgive me, it might take me a minute to read some of these. Okay, the first one, Brian, how would you tie the scans into conventional project data to control the location, orientation, and vertical components of each manhole structure. So Brian, we'll throw that out to you. Yeah, thanks. That, that's a great question. Um, I, I might have touched on it briefly during the uh, during the presentation, the ability to do georeferencing. Um, so there's a variety of ways to do it. Um, we can use, on, on board the scanner, we have a plate that sits on the bottom of the handle that we call our reference base plate. It has a crosshair in it. Um, so we can obtain real world control points as reference points in the, in the point cloud data um, by uh, simply taking the system and setting that, that base plate with the crosshair right on top of the point. If you leave it stationary for 10 seconds, it will log a reference point in the point cloud data. And then we can in post-processing um, in our hub software, assign each one of those reference points to a real world control point. You need at least three per data set in order to, um, to get a good georeferencing in, in position. Um, but that's the simplest way to do it. We can also do something very similar in our draw software. Uh, within our draw software, we can do things like 
extract uh, spherical targets or checkerboard targets or other kind of visual targets as well. Um, so if you don't want to use that, that base plate, or especially if you're using um, the system on like a telescoping pole, um, that's going to make it a little bit difficult to use that base plate. So you can use those physical targets to do essentially the same thing, pull those as, as uh, reference points and then assign uh, real world control points uh, to them uh, within our draw software or within a third party software as well. Uh, if you want to work with the data within uh, Trimble software or something similar, um, that's an option for you also. Okay. Um, there'll be up if uh, you have questions that come up later too, or if you have more add on questions to your original one. Uh, the GoToWebinar software will automatically send out a survey afterwards, and you'll have an opportunity to um, submit more questions there if you have any. So thanks for that, Brian. Uh, we do have a couple more questions. Uh, the next one is, are these units gimbal mounted? Do you see waves in the data due to walking motions? That's another really good question. So um, they are not gimbal mounted. Uh, that is actually the purpose or one of the primary purposes of the IMU on board uh, the scanner head. Um, so the IMU is, is tracking your movement and tracking um, the, the tilt and, and roll and pitch and yaw and all that kind of stuff of, of the system in real time. And it's using that to basically self-level continuously um, as you move it. So the orientation of the scanner uh, has no effect on the data. Um, as long as you're not making very, very rapid movements like um, really quick turns or um, dropping the system or something like that, it shouldn't have any effect on the data uh, whatsoever and you, you won't see any, any, kind of, um, any kind of shifts or waves or distortion in the data from, from movements. Um, as I've said, these systems can be mounted onto vehicles. We've mounted them on uh, like autonomous robots and scanned that way. We've mounted them on UAVs and, and flown them over, over sites. And um, they, they do very well with changes in orientation and direction and position over time. Um, that's really their sweet spot. So that's what makes them so modular and easy, easy to use um, and perfect for applications like, like scanning manholes. Okay, thank you. With each unit being accurate from one centimeter to three centimeters, is that at the maximum distance of closer? Would that mean that any manhole measurements within that combined space would be accurate to those specs? Some manholes have very shallow slopes and three centimeters could have a greater impact on as-built structures for final engineering approval on plan sets. Okay, that's a great question also. Um, so the just to specify a little bit more on the accuracy. So one, one to three centimeters is what we call a global accuracy. So that would be uh, from one side of the capture all the way to the other. In the case of a manhole, it's such a, a small localized area. Um, you're really relying more on what we call local accuracy. And local accuracy is essentially the accuracy of the sensor inside of the scanner and not so much the accuracy of slam algorithm to stitch data together. So that one to three centimeters comes into play when we're talking about scanning something like a building. Say you scanned an exterior loop around uh, a large you know, office building or something like that. Um, from one corner of that building to the opposite corner of that building, you should be able to pull a measurement within one to three centimeters of global accuracy. Um, when you're talking about a manhole, that's something that's that's very small and localized. You're relying on that local accuracy, and that local accuracy is more like uh, less than one centimeter. It's zero to one centimeters of local accuracy with any of our systems. Um, it's a little bit tighter with the Revo and the ZebGo, um, and it's a little bit looser with the Horizon because I mentioned there's so much more noise in the data um, with the Horizon system than with a Revo system. Um, but either way, you should be able to basically average through that noise and still get an accuracy of, of uh, sub-centimeter. Okay, thank you. Then we have a question about uh, arranging for a demo uh, from your demo in the, do demo in the box program. Uh, just, just contact me. So my email address is on the, uh, currently on the screen right there. 
and I can set up um, any of those uh, demonstrations for you. Okay. Can you store multiple manholes by name or number? Yeah, so you should be able to, especially with our Revo RT system, when you start the scanner, um, you can create a project name for it or a capture name for it. Um, so yeah, you just add, add that number into the, the naming convention. Um, the other way that you would do it is if you do post-processing. So if you're using the Horizon or the Zebgo system, all the processing is done in post, um, as well as like project naming uh, off of the data logger, you're going to get a timestamp. It's going to be a date and a timestamp for the capture. Um, so that can help you kind of organize, um, organize your projects. And then uh, on the back end in the hub software, you can assign it a name uh, based on its, its location or um, its numbering system or, or um, yeah, what, whatever makes the most sense for, for your organize, uh, organizing your project. Okay, thank you, Brian. Uh, another question, how many manholes can be stored in one day of mapping? That's a good question. Um, so I think, it, like, like I said, it takes only about five minutes or so to actually scan the manhole. Um, in our experience, the, the longest part of the process is just getting the manhole open and uh, you know getting the the uh, cover out of the way and uh, clearing out any debris around it and that kind of stuff. So all, all of that adds time. Um, I would say reasonably, you know, it, it's not going to take you any more than maybe 20 or 30 minutes per manhole. Um, also depends on you know how much time between the two. So um, if you map that out over an eight-hour day, you're probably looking at somewhere between you know, 15 and 20 manholes per day, but uh, there's a couple, couple different variations uh, or variables there. So um, yeah, that seems like uh, kind of a reasonable number, somewhere between 15 and 20 for a, a typical workday. So you actually see that being more of a personnel time limitation as opposed to uh, memory on your logger. That's right. Yeah, if you, if you could have, um, yeah, you're not going to fill up the data logger. Uh, I mean, it's going to take you probably a couple of weeks of, of scanning straight to fill up the data logger. Um, once you fill up the data logger, you can back up all of that data and then just delete it off of the data logger and, and keep going. So that is um, a portion of, of the, um, you know, just kind of data management of the, of the system to, to be able to pull stuff off of there. But you shouldn't have you won't be able to scan enough in a day to fill up the data logger. Okay. Uh, next question. Can you dial down the noise you mentioned with the horizon? That is a good question. So um, we are currently working on developing some, some filters and things that can help you uh, kind of manually um, fix the noise or get rid of noise. Uh, right now, we have the ability on export of data to uh, do what we call smoothing. So we apply a smoothing filter, and that helps get rid of some of the noise on surfaces and uh, what we call artifacting off of art objects. So the edges of objects sometimes have some stray points that kind of uh, fly off the edges, um, and it'll get rid of a lot of that kind of stuff. But um, it's basically on or off. Uh, it doesn't, doesn't give you any kind of... Um, like dials or anything that you can that you can change, but that is coming here in the near future um, to accommodate for the horizon data. Great. Well, that looks like all of the questions uh, that we have there. I'd like to thank everybody for taking time out of their busy schedules and spending what well, looks like about an hour with us today. So thank you very much. As we mentioned at the start of the webinar, uh, this webinar has been recorded and it will be placed on our Frontier Perception precision YouTube channel. So we'll send you an email with a link to that. So if you have colleagues that you'd like to show that to, or you'd like to review that again to answer questions or see the information again, that link will be sent to you. So thank you very much. And we'll go ahead and close things down now. Thank you.